Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to the Energy Symposium today. There is no talk next week, which is spring break, so there's no t uh, Energy Symposium talk for next uh, seven days from now. So I will just introduce our speaker today, Mr. Jorge Pinon. Uh, Jorge is a uh, wealth of knowledge about the history of <laughs> oil and gas industry, I guess, in general, but also it, in, in the Western Hemisphere and in Latin America. So uh, I think we're in for a treat for somebody who, who knows a lot of the history and who was involved in a lot of things. And there's probably a lot of things he could tell us that he won't tell us while he's being recorded. Uh, Jorge, to remind you, you're being recorded uh, when you speak. So uh, keep that in mind. But Jorge here is helping leading the Latin America and Caribbean so energy studies program within the Jackson School uh, and the Center for International Energy and Environmental Policy. Uh, he has a history uh, in the oil and gas industry with Amoco Oil before it was bought by P BP and Shell before that and his own oil and gas exploration company in between there. So he has a long history in the oil and gas sector. So uh, he's going to give us, he's, he's filling in for us for uh, someone who, who backed out a relatively short minute a short notice, so he's going to give us a talk that he's uh, given before, but uh, I've had uh, some good opportunities to have conversations with Jorge one-on-one uh, -on -one in the past, and so uh, we'll see what he can fill in the 45 minutes, but he's, got, uh, he's probably got a career worth of stuff to tell you over a, uh, uh, you know, over a, uh, a much longer time span. So he works with different organizations. He helps UT get uh, relationships with Mexico for research, uh, the State Department, so he's doing a lot for the University of Texas to get us on the map, even internationally, so, so to say, so uh, in Latin America in particular. So this is the emphasis of the university. So it's good to have Jorge here and tell us uh, how we should be thinking about these issues in the Western Hemisphere. So Jorge, thank, thank you, you very much. Take Hello, Nick. I'm all right. With that introduction, I can, I can hire you as my campaign manager if I decide to run for public office somewhere. Uh, we have a small enough group that what I would like to have is really a conversation. Um, you know, lectures are fine, but sometimes after a while they get boring. Uh, so please do not hesitate to, to interrupt me and, and, and really begin a dialogue. I think it's a small enough group uh, that we can have a conversation. Uh, what I want to do today is share with you some thoughts and, and some ideas on geopolitics of, of oil, particularly in the Western Hemisphere. I'm not going to give you any finite definition because what I would like to do is for you guys to leave this room and have your own debate and discussion about things that, well, Pignon said this. I don't believe him or this or that. I want to create that debate among yourselves. So I'm not give, going to give you a lot of answers. Um, I'm going to give you a lot of challenges that region have, uh, particularly from the geopolitical point of view. Uh, again, uh, my idea, my goal is that you guys leave this room and have then a conversation and a debate among yourselves. About two weeks ago, we were in Brookings, um, in Washington. There were 17 of us in a roundtable morning breakfast discussion. And it, it is another beautiful subject, really, to have a conversation about. And the roundtable for breakfast among a group of us was a debate around energy independence and energy security. Is there really such a thing as energy independence? Or is it the conversation that we want to have is really about energy security? Uh, because we talked about the global world of, of energy, particularly the global world of oil and gas, and the definition of the discussion at the table was, is there really such a thing as energy independence, particularly when you throw in prices and other factors? Uh, again, not the subject of today, uh, but really a subject that we started at 8 o'clock in the morning and we were still there at 11 o'clock trying to get out of there, and the debate was still going on. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to do. I really want to have a conversation with you folks. This is a presentation that I actually have given it twice, uh, generally the same idea. Uh, one was at Department of Defense Southern Command um, in Doral in South Florida, and then the most recent one, this one, which was in Monterey, California, uh, before the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, and again, the discussion was the geopolitics of oil uh, from the point of view of that oil is a worldwide fungible commodity. In other words, oil is not a national issue. Oil, in fact, is not a regional issue. 
oil today moves across borders, refined products, whether it's gasoline, fuel oil, moves across the world around borders. In fact, today, natural gas is also a true fungible worldwide commodity because finally now we have LNG. So that has really opened up LNG as well as crude oil. They are worldwide fungible commodities. So when you think about something that might happen in the Far East, when it might happen in Africa or in another, it will affect you. It will impact you, irregardless of where we are. So that's the first concept that I wanted to share with you guys, whether it is refined products or whether it is crude oil or whether it is natural gas in the form of LNG, they're true fungible commodities. Sure, you might have heavy sour, light crude oil, but generally, it is a fungible uh, commodity. So, so that's the first concept that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, second one is the value chain. Um, whenever we talk about oil, it's usually an upstream conversation from a supply point of view. But we don't realize that oil has crude oil itself has very little commercial value. The commercial value is in refining once you convert that crude oil into refined products, whether it's jet fuel, whether it's gasoline, whether it's diesel, that you can then commercialize. So we have to recognize that between the upstream side of the business, you do have other processes that add value, and again, it has geopolitical impact, and that is both uh, in the, on the midstream, on the, does it work? Yeah. Um, well, anyway, in the, in the midstream, on the upfront, and then on the, on the midstream, in the back end, uh, in, in, re in refined products. Let me share a couple of things with you. The Keystone Pipeline. Favorite subject for many of us. We can also spend a nice conversation about talking about the Keystone Pipeline. What impact does something like the Keystone Pipeline would have in the geopolitics of oil? Any thought? First of all, Canadian crude is heavy. We're going to be able to bring in additional Canadian crude, which, by the way, is nothing new. We're already importing quite a bit of it and refined in the Gulf Coast. But what's going to have, that's going to have an impact on any other foreign heavy oil that is coming into the Gulf Coast, Venezuela and Mexico. The United States will be then in a much better position to ne not necessarily that we're going to cut off imports from Mexico and from Venezuela, but it certainly gives us a much better relationship or point to negotiate, for example, price. Why? Because now I can bring in an alternative crude oil on a pipeline, by the way, that it could be as, as much as 30, 40 cents a barrel improvement in cost because it's not a ship, it's a pipeline. Less inventory less losses, you don't have any demerge costs, and so on. So now the United States, once the pipeline really gets on full stream, and we will have full capacity to import Canadian heavy crude, we can use that as leverage, again, energy security, energy independence, against other heavy oil supplies coming into the U.S. So the Keystone Pipeline, which you see, it is really a Canadian U.S. asset, is going to have an impact in Latin America relationships with the U.S. The shale revolution. In 2005, the United States imported 1.1 million barrels a day from Nigeria, and we were importing as much as 500,000 barrels a day from Angola. In fact, Hillary Clinton, on her first year as Secretary of State, made a specific trip to Luanda, the capital of Angola, because we wanted to build a relationship with Angola vis-a-vis -vis China for the sweet crude oil production or intermediate crude oil production where that was coming out of Angola. Today, the Nigerian imports from 1.1 million barrels a day in 2005 is about 100,000 barrels a day. Why? Because of light sweet crude that came out of hydraulic fracking and the shale revolution. So all of a sudden, the U.S. was long sweet light crude. And then we turn our backs on, strategically, two West African countries that were very important to us. 
both Nigeria and Angola. And today, Nigeria and Angola, again, both of them less than 200,000 barrels a day of imports compared to about a million barrels a day back in 2005. So there are two events that happened within North America, the Keystone Pipeline and the Shale Revolution, that had an impact outside of our borders. Uh, and, 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 and that's what I'm trying to share uh, with you guys. Second one is the second back end of the midstream. So let me talk about gasoline, and let me talk about diesel, and let me talk about fuel oil and jet fuel. Puerto Rico is about 1,100 miles from the U.S. Puerto Rico doesn't have a refinery. The, re the last refinery belonged to Shell. They shut it down back uh, oh, about eight years ago. So Puerto Rico today is a net importer of refined products. They import their gasoline. They import their, their jet fuel. Every one of the refined products, butane, propane, you name it, is imported into Puerto Rico. It is 1,100 miles from Houston, 1,100 miles from the U.S. Gulf Coast. Uh, shipping, you can load up a ship in uh, Port Arthur for gasoline and have it in San Juan within five and a half, six days. Puerto Rico does not import one single barrel of refined products from the U.S., not one single barrel. Anybody knows why? Why doesn't Puerto Rico import refined products from the U.S.? Because they would have to be shipped by U.S. ships and the shipping costs would be too great. The Jones Act. One of the theories, which by the way, the Jones Act goes back a long way. One of the theories of Mr. Trump. What the Jones Act says is that any cabotage shipping, which is cabotage, is basically shipping within national ports, has to be on U.S. built ships, U.S. owned ships, and U.S. crewed ships. In other words, the crew of the ships have to be U.S. citizens. So it makes the cost of moving fuel or gasoline from Houston to San Juan prohibitive. So let me share with you last month's imports of Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico last month imported their gasoline from Lithuania. Now, I don't know how many of you guys took Geo Geography 101, all right, but I think most of us know where Lithuania is. Lithuania is basically about 5,000 miles from San Juan, and it's a 19-day trip. They imported diesel from India. They imported gasoline also from Denmark, uh, from Finland, um, from uh, Russia. Uh, there were barrels coming in from Sweden. There was a cargo of jet fuel from Singapore. All the way from Singapore to San Juan, Puerto Rico. And Singapore is 10,000 miles, 43-day transit. Again, what I'm trying to, to share with you is that when you talk about geopolitics and the impact that has in oil, going back to the debate of around oil independence and oil security, price also has a huge impact. And regulations like the Jones Act, that really most of us forget about it. Most of us are not aware that still the Jones Act is on the books. Puerto Rico today, their gasoline consumption is about 50,000 barrels a day. Total product consumption in, in Puerto Rico is about 140,000 and 137,000 barrels a day. So it's a, you know, it's a little island, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of cars running around. And again, shut down your refineries. Uh, the, the investment cost in those refineries wasn't worth it. Uh, became a net importer. They have the terminals. They have the flexibility. Uh, and again, here's the U.S. just six days away. And where do they get all of their barrels from? around the world, again, just because of, of the Jones Act. Uh, so those are the things that I want you to think about when, you t when we talk about the geopolitics of oil. It's not only in the upstream, it also belongs in the midstream, pipelines, and it also belongs on, on the other end. Refining, we're going to talk about it here in a minute. The U.S., for the first time, is a net in exporter let me repeat that again. For the first time ever, the U.S. is a net exporter of refined products. 
our U.S. Gulf Coast refineries are running at 91% of capacity. 91% of capacity. We have become the de facto refining center for Latin America. I'm getting ahead of myself. We're going to talk about Mexico, for example. Today, we are exporting 80% of Mexico's gasoline demand, 500,000 barrels a day of gasoline. That's keeping, talk about job creation. Job creation is what we, what we have created by the refining system that we have in the Gulf Coast. I remember when I was with Shell back a long time ago, when we were making, all of us, whether it was Chevron or in Pascagoula or whether it was Exxon, we were making multi-million dollar investments in upgrading capacity because we knew that what was coming down the pipeline were going to be heavy crude oils. And we knew that we needed to have not only the distillation capacity to get the right yield, but we also needed the conversion capacity to get high proportion of, of, of fuels, high proportion of clean fuels. We have a huge strategic competitive advantage in the Gulf of Mexico in our refining capacity. When you think about oil, when you think about geopolitics, it is not only crude oil, it is also refining capacity. Uh, EIA 2015 is missing on this slide. Um, re, uh, oil in the ground to me, uh, I'm an upstream guy, I'm not a downstream guy. I mean, uh, I'm a downstream guy, not an upstream guy. Uh, oil in the ground to me has to be monetized. Uh, otherwise, it has zero value. You have to get it out of the ground. If you don't get it out of the ground, uh, you know, we'll talk about Venezuela in a minute. Uh, but when you look at Venezuela, Venezuela today is the largest country in the world with the largest number of reserves, larger than Saudi Arabia. And Venezuela, for the first time, is close to only 2 million barrels a day of production. When in their 2005 plan, Venezuela was expecting to be around 4 million barrels a day of production. And we'll talk about the Venezuelan case in a minute. Uh, but, but there's another good example uh, that just because you happen to be the largest holder of reserves doesn't mean anything. You still have to get it out of the ground and you still have to commercialize it. Um, yes, the Middle East is big, uh, but when you add, again, North America and South America, it's a big piece of the pie. Uh, and again, if you all agree with my first slide that oil today is a true fungible commodity, you have to look at, re in fact, there's an argument about my, my Western Hemisphere uh, issue that was brought up in Monterey and the discussion began about that it was, it was really a transatlantic, that, 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 you know, West Africa was also part of this scenario um, of uh, geopolitics evolving in our area, that we had to also add to this conversation uh, not only Argentina and Canada, but that we also had to add uh, Gabon, Cameroon, um, Nigeria, Angola, all of those new producers coming on stream in, in West Africa. Uh, again, the same thing with, uh, uh, with shale. Um, uh, we, we failed to recognize um, sometime from, uh, from shale the position that we're in today, which the U.S. is exporting not only refined products, but the U.S. is also now exporting crude oil. President Obama, I think it was back in October or in November, when lifted the export ban. In fact, who's the la largest in the last six months? Who is the largest importer of U.S. crude? Mexico. No. That, that's, you, that, by the way, that is where the, that's the right answer, <laughs> but that's not reality. It is Venezuela. Here's Mr. Maduro and Mr. Chavez, you know, the, you know, the gringos and the whole bit. Well, now they're importing WTI and bringing it into Bonaire and Bullen Bay, which are the two transshipment and blending terminals in the Caribbean, because they need to blend it with their heavy crude to meet their export obligations to India and, uh, and to China. Venezuela's light and medium production has gone down. That crude was needed in order to blend it with their heavy crude to be able to be commercialized. Uh, they used to produce huge amount of, of Mesa 30 crude, 30 gravity API crude, 
which is the one that they used to use as a blending stock. So now Venezuela, Venezuela is importing crude from the U.S., taking it to Bonaire and to Bullen Bay to blend with their heavy stuff to export it to India and to China, their two largest customers outside of the U.S. Again, geopolitics of oil, how things change. I would have never, I've been in this business for quite a while. I began my career with Shell as, 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 as a crude oil scheduler, bringing in cargoes from Aruba and from Venezuela. Who would have thought, who would have thought that the time would come in which the U.S. would be an exporter of crude oil to Venezuela? LNG. How many terminals did we build in the Gulf Coast, right, to regas LNG that we were going to import? Now we're going the other way around. Now we're becoming, all of those regas facilities are now being turned into liquefaction facilities so we can become, and we will become, a major exporter of LNG. Major geopolitical change. I got a couple of geologists in the, in the room, so I have to be careful what I say, but, 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 but you, when you look at shale, uh, and someone helped me out, but, but shale has been in the literature going back to the 19th century. I mean, the, 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 the fact of, of hydrocarbons within shale, geological shale structures, or tidal, however you want to mention it, has been in the books for a long time. There you go. I knew, you see, that's why, that, that's why you have to be careful. You, you always look in the audience to see, okay, where is the guy that really has all the answers? I got to be careful what I say. Richard Kukla with the Jackson School. Um, but what brings, about, what brings about the shale revolution? Two events. One is the price of oil. It finally becomes economic to at least begin the process of identifying the technology that will allow you to monetize it. The second one is technology. And here we are today. It wasn't necessary that we discover hydrocarbons within geological shale structures. We knew that. It was again the monetization of the resource. It was again the monetization of the resource brought about price and brought about technology. Again, guys, you know, we, let's, we can have a um, um, conversation. Um, this is where, uh, again, I'm a downstreamer, and, and, and this, is a, this is the conversation that I was sharing with you earlier uh, about uh, how the U.S. Uh, situation has changed, uh, not only as an importer of crude oil, uh, but also as, a, as an exporter of um, uh, of refined products. Uh, you can see that the Middle East is no longer strategically the major supplier of crude oil to the U.S. Why is the Middle East important to us? Why is stability in the Middle East, in the Persian Gulf, is important to us? Is it because of supply or is it because of something else? That was half of the morning conversation at Brookings. That there's no such a thing as energy independence because you're eventually going to be impacted by price. Even if you're self-sufficient, even if you're self-sufficient, your broad eco economy is going to be impacted. I argue that our interest in the Persian Gulf is not that we want to be able, we want to grab their oil. I mean, the, 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 the narrative, the narrative is the nationalistic, anti-imperialist vision of the gringos are coming and all that they want is our oil. No, what I want in the Middle East, what you and I want in the Middle East is stability. Because what we cannot afford as a society, what the world cannot afford as a society, is $250 oil. 
So the importance of the Middle East to the United States from a geopolitical point of view, in fact, the importance of the Middle East to the world is stability, political stability, political continuation, avoid situations in which huge volatility in the prices will have a major impact, irregardless if you're energy independent. Um, look at, look, this is, this is, this is awesome. Um, we are exporting today about four million barrels a day of refined products. We are exporting about 400 million barrels a day of refined products. Um, almost 50% to Latin America. Um, the rest is going to a number of other countries. Uh, by the way, there is a huge change coming up. Uh, the IMO, the International Marine Organization, is changing their requirements for bunkers and for fuel oils, where now low sulfur fuel has, it, it's going to be uh, less than 1% sulfur for bunkers is going to come into effect. That has a, that's going to have a huge impact. Uh, refineries that didn't have cokers will have to build cokers. Mexico today is long fuel oil. Uh, in, in, for those of you that are in the electric power sector, uh, you know, we're switching to, uh, from fuel oil to natural gas. So another major impact that the industry sees here in the next five years is fuel oil. What to do with all the fuel oil, particularly in countries like Latin America and others that don't have the conversion capacity. So that's another major geopolitical impact uh, that is going to happen in our markets. Uh, but again, the U.S., it's, um, you know, it's good news for Texas. Huge good news for, for Texas. Um, why? Uh, refineries, there, there are three key numbers. When you look at refinery capacity, there are three key numbers or figures that you have to, number one, boilerplate capacity. When you build a refinery, you find this refinery can run 100,000 barrels a day. Really, a refinery never runs at 100% of capacity. Uh, a refinery, a good refinery, if you run a good refinery, uh, I think everybody would be satisfied to run that at, you know, 87, 88% of capacity. If you can run above a 90% number, you're doing extremely good. The problem that we have in the world today, uh, particularly in Latin America, is that the throughput it's much less, and in some areas as, as little as 65% of capacity, because for many, many, many years, these refineries have been owned by state oil companies, and they didn't have the capital, for example, for maintenance. They didn't have the capital to upgrade, and the refinery throughput just fell through the floor. Mexico, last month, for the first time in its history, refined less than a million barrels a day and they have a capacity of 1.6 million barrels a day. It was, I'm sorry, in December. The month of December, Mexico processed in their refineries about 980,000 barrels a day. Bad crude oil, they run heavy crude, They're still, they still don't understand the value of importing U.S. crude. It's again a nationalistic approach. Mexico believes the crude is mine, I have to run my own crude. No, you don't. You have to look at the economic benefits of running crude. If it is more economical and better and it makes more sense for you to, write, to, to run West African crude, sell your crude, export it, and bring in African. Oh, no, 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 no. How could we? We would never bring in crude from somebody else. Capital. They never spend any money on capital. The new refinery in Tula, 250,000 barrels a day, $6 billion. By the way, the, the last refinery that was built in Latin America was in Brazil, was in Pernambuco. It was supposed to cost about 4 billion barrels, ended up costing like 12 billion barrels. I mean, $12 billion. So refineries today are not easy. And the problem with Latin America is not only the lack of fuels, but also the lack of clean fuels. They cannot meet the low sulfur standards that their countries need for fuels for the next five to 10 years. Again, geopolitical dependency. It is not only that the country is going to be, become a net importer of refined products, you need clean fuels. So it's not only capacity, it's also the quality of the fuels. Two other aspects. Two other aspects that impacts the geopolitics of oil.
How am I doing? Is somebody going to keep me honest? Or um, here's a uh, and 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 Richard, you're welcome to to to, to chime in. Uh, we could make this list real long. We could make it short. I went ahead and and and, and grouped it together. Um, when somebody sits in Houston, an oil company sits in Houston and looks at at the potential uh, geology of a country and and whether the, the, the technology is there and you know how much can we produce and should we go to Argentina, should we go to Colombia, should we go to Guyana, uh, you know you have that conversation uh, from the, the potential resource of the country but then you have also another conversation which is can I get it out of the ground and most important the last one in the bottom which is political continuity. Remember that our industry is one in which all of the investments are up front. All right, Mexico just had their big concessions in December for deep water Gulf of Mexico. Everybody went in, BHP, Chevron, ExxonMobil, Statoil, a number of folks were winners and they got for the first time in 75 years deep water concessions in the Gulf of Mexico on the Mexican side. But in the next five years, they're going to invest billions of dollars, billions of dollars in infrastructure to bring that oil out of the ground. In order for them to get an economic return, their production horizon has to be 20, 25, 30 years. So they cannot go into a country like Mexico. It's, 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 going, it's, it's just like if you're going to Las Vegas and you're at a table and you're doing well, big pot, you have your hand, and the dealer decides to change the rules of the game in the middle of the hand. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, we want to change the rules. So political continuity is very important. But first, the country has to give you the fiscal investment contractual terms and conditions that are attractive both for the host country, by the way. But if anyone thinks that the oil companies come into the, some of these countries to take advantage of them, that is a very short-term strategy. Smart oil company recognizes that there is also a national interest in which it is in the best interest of the national of the oil company of the international oil company to do a fair deal. So that's important. Rule of law. I mean, critical. You're going to get into an argument. You know, when when you reach an agreement, eventually you're going to have to pull that agreement out of the out of the file and have a, a legal discussion about that agreement. It's going to happen. So you need to be sure that you have the rule of law, transparency, accountability, integrity, which is corruption. All of those issues are very important. Regulatory framework. You can go to a lot of countries and you find the best regulations. You go to the shelf, you pull it out, you read the regulations and say, this is fantastic. I want to, I want to work here. I want to come and invest. But what's wrong is the enforcement of those regulations and the regulators. Are they corrupt? Uh, so, regulations in the books, from a legislative point of view, is only one piece of the pie. The second piece of the pie is the enforcement of those regulations and the transparency in the enforcement of those regulations. Infrastructure, no question about it, labor availability, competence in skills and regulations. Oil companies today, when they go into a foreign country, they bring two key components. Two key tools, one capital and the other one is technology. But they really don't come with a wheelbarrow. That wheelbarrow, that asset, you hope to find it in the country. Expats today are very expensive. You don't want to walk into a new country with 100 or 200 expats. You want to create the national cadre of professionals, of, of geologists, of, of, of trade folks that can really supply and provide you the labor services that you want. So that, the competency, labor, skills, is extremely important in, in, any, in any major or country that you're going today. Environmental, biodiversity, Ecuador, indigenous communities, huge challenge. How, how can a country like Ecuador with significant resources can monetize those resources in an environment in which biodiversity and the indigenous communities are key and a very important factor. By the way, a key and very important factor that not only the host country 
considers, but also the oil countries, the oil, the oil companies consider as very important. The world today is not the world of Lago Agrio in Ecuador going back to 1970 something. It is highly unlikely that Lago Agrio would happen today. Highly unlikely. Um, Lago Agrio was a joint venture between Texaco and the Ecuadorian, Ecuadorian National Oil Company um, that over many, many years, from an environmental point of view, high degree of pollution uh, in Ecuador took place out of uh, the production from Lago Agrio. Um, in the 1980s, if I have my timeline correct, um, Texaco exited Ecuador. Uh, the assets were turned over to Petro Ecuador and they became a 100% uh, operator. Uh, Ecuador, uh, Texaco eventually joined venture with Chevron. And then, of course, recently you know uh, that Ecuador has sued uh, Chevron in a number of courts uh, because of all of the pollution and contamination that happened in, in, in Lago Agrio. Uh, again, poor management. Uh, things were done back then uh, that under no way uh, that you would have done uh, today. Uh, and the government of Ecuador is now trying to collect from Chevron, um, which didn't have anything to do with, with the incident. Um, and of course, remember that at that time, Texaco had a partner, which was the National Oil Company. Uh, even though the operator was Texaco, also the, na the National Oil Company had a piece of the pie. Uh, so Lago Agrio is one of those, if, if you guys ever want to look at it and have a test case and, and have a conversation about the challenge between biodiversity, um, uh, indigenous community, how a company used to operate in a country like Ecuador, Lago Agrio will be a perfect test case uh, for you guys to, to have a conversation uh, around. Um, safety and security. Today, uh, again, for those of us that came out of, of uh, I retired from BP um, and with experience of, of the Deepwater Horizon, um, we all recognize today, and if you go back the Exxon Valdez and the Amaco Cadiz, I mean, health, safety, and the environment is a key economic component to the business that we do. It is not only good policy, it is good business. And I'm not talking only about a major oil spill. I'm talking about the safety culture of the company in which you operate. Um, you know, DuPont, uh, whenever we, we needed to bring somebody to talk about HSE, we always used to bring somebody from DuPont to talk about it because DuPont has a very good relation, uh, history on their HSE policies. And, and we have had guys from DuPont come in and talk about, talk about the handrail on stairs. We have had a conversation in which a DuPont executive talked to us for a good 20 minutes about walking down and up the stairs and handrails. Because what he was trying to share with us was the culture of safety. The handrail is there for something. For example, we did something here now, starting this meeting, that I, I go ahead and I say, mia culpa. In the company that I used to work for, you never started a meeting like this without having a safety minute. And in this room, in this audience, the first thing that we will point out will be the exits. Even, even no, no, I know. It, 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 might sound, it might sound silly. It is not. Because the issue around safety is culture. You can have all the buttons, I mean, you, you can have all the facilities built in a certain way that you think you're going to guarantee safety. If you look back and you look at the deep water horizon, at the end of the day, somebody needed to say, stop. Somebody needed to say, stop. Whatever you're doing, stop. It wasn't an issue of the asset. It was an issue of the culture in management and in the operators in which somebody should have called timeout. And that wasn't done. So anyway, uh, I'm being given the five minute, or less than five minutes, or two minute oh, signal. Yes. In that uh, vein, uh, I knew that Deep Water Horizon was going to bring a. <laughs> <laughs> <This> is, uh, <laughs> my question's more in the, 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 the question of climate and climate change. And rather than focus on 
the, you know, the, the, the broader issue of climate change, just the asset issue, the downstream asset issue, as, uh, as the, we change the risk profile of probable events, and we'll, uh, just for example, I'll focus on uh, uh, seawater level rise, as the probability of that coming forward in time and the height increasing, we're starting to enter the, the, the asset lifetimes. You talk 25, 30 years, the worst projections are around 2100, but the probability envelope is changing. And so, you know, there are some estimates that say well, some of the tipping events could transpire and bring that forward into the 2060 time horizon. The so I, I'm wondering, are, are, is that being seen? That's the, you, you're, you're trying to focus on the climate change impact on, on, the, the, on the industry. In the, in the asset, on the asset base. In the infrastructure it's building and is, how's that being absorbed? I, I, I think any asset infrastructure has a time limit outside of climate change. In other words, whether it's a refinery unit or any other unit, either through maintenance or something else, has a time limit. Um, especially if you don't keep it, you know, on a regular maintenance scale. Some of our refiners in Port Arthur, the, ones, the one in, ba in Baton Rouge, uh, has been around for a number of years. Um, clim the impact of climate change itself uh, through maybe weather? If you look at most refineries in the world, most refineries in the world for very obvious reasons are located on the coast. And right. so they are in places that Arguably, if you're looking at any facilities, they're going to be more susceptible to, to uh, rising rise. waters and hurricanes and, and, and that sort fact, of thing. And in fact, during the during the uh, Hurricane Katrina, right, there were some very serious refinery outages right. that were due to right. flooding, you know, due to a, right. to an extreme climate event. So, uh, earthquakes yeah. or in the West Coast. I mean, how could an earthquake impact uh, refineries in Martinez and in Wilmington and so on? Anacortes. Uh, quickly, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, from a resource base, Canada, Mexico, Trinidad and Tobago, Brazil, Argentina, uh, from a governance point of view, continuity. I don't think Canada is going to invade us anytime soon unless we start some conversation around hockey or something like that. Uh, Mexico, I, I, I think there's continuity in Mexico. People think that with the coming elections in 2018, we might see a change. I don't think so. So to me, if you look at resource base, if you talk about governance issues, if you look, if you look about continuity, Brazil has its problems. Uh, but again, I think Brazil will get its, its show uh, back in, in order. And the same thing with Argentina. So if I, I, if I was to group a number of, of countries, this grouping to me is one that the risk is manageable. Let me put it to you that way. Uh, the second group is a group in which the risk is also manageable. Um, but you have other factors uh, to take a look at. Uh, Colombia still, uh, by the way, Colombia as far as governance and, and continuity is the poster child of the industry. The problem with Colombia nowadays is that the resource base is declining and it, it, it's becoming more challenging. Guyana, Guyana is a major country today in which Exxon had a major, two major discoveries. Uh, and the challenge in Guyana, by the way, uh, and we, we, we're discussing it with, with some government officials, is that this is a country of 750,000 people. And they're about to face the big, I mean, this is a country that's going to become extremely wealthy. And how do they manage those resources for future generations in Guyana is extremely important. Uh, so Guyana is a, Guyana, by the way, for any of you guys that like to look at that, Guyana is a beautiful country for you guys to study and take a look at a, at a case study. Here's a country, very poor, 750,000 people, all of a sudden, the good news is they found oil. The bad news, they found oil. It's a beautiful conversation for you guys to have. Uh, Uruguay, somebody said, you know, what are you, what are you talking about Uruguay? Uruguay offshore, it's another one of those that's there, uh, Peru, and then the ugly. And the ugly, not necessarily because of a resource base, uh, but ugly because of governance and continuity. And governance and continuity because uh, <laughs> you have a group of folks that just, they, don't, they just don't know how to run a business. Populist government, 
that you know squeeze that that milk cow uh, that cow out of you know because they have to meet whatever nationalistic policies they have and the asset just excuse my english just goes to hell um, and and that group of folks there have not known how to run a national oil company period um, quickly last slide Somebody asked me, can we talk for about two minutes about the price of oil? Where are we going? The first slide on the left is one that I always like to use because we forget that not long ago we hit $144 a barrel. On the 8th of July of 2008, you guys, all of us guys, were probably paying close to $4 a gallon for gasoline. Right? And all of a sudden, my wife walks home and says, I'm carpooling. Let's get rid of our Suburban. I can't afford the Suburban. It cost me $150 to fill up the Suburban. And my dear wife all of a sudden became conscientious about saving and uh, no longer. We have now two Suburbans. Right? Who, let me ask you a question. We, who, if, if I give you a choice tomorrow of $2 gas or $5 gas, what would you rather have? $2 gas. In fact, look at pickup sales in this state. They're going through the, through the roof. I lived in Spain. I, lived with, uh, I worked with PP in Madrid for five years. By the way, uh, today our average is 2 something, 210, 220, I think. European community is about $6 a gallon. But that $6 a gallon is what's changed the culture of the Europeans, mass transit, uh, the, 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 the sub suburban living is different. Every time I go to Miami or every time I drive somewhere and I, I, knew, I see a new subdivision being built way out there, I run out and buy more shares in, in, in Chevron and Shell. Every time I see the expressway, an expressway being expanded from two lanes to five lanes to make our life easier, I go and buy more shares on the oil companies. Instead of making life tough for us so that we learn how to conserve, so that we learn how to carpool, so, nah, cheap gasoline. No, no government official, even if he or she is running as a dog catcher, will get elected if he or she says, we're going to raise gasoline prices. What happened to 55 miles an hour? Go and tell somebody here in Texas that you have to go back to a 55 mile an hour speed limit. They'll lock you up. Uh, it dropped. It came down to actually an intraday in December. The day, the day after Christmas, on an intraday basis, it traded $36 a barrel. I mean, yeah, $36, $35 a barrel. And then, of course, we saw that it, it, it recovered. It was unrealistic. And then we see the next five years that range between 80 to 100 dollars a barrel uh, and then the collapse that we saw beginning in 2015 quickly uh, what happened today what happened today we broke 50 dollars a barrel we're going back south why economics 101 supply demand don't, don't, don't make it any more difficult than that I mean economics 101 supply demand Yes, OPEC says I'm going to cut off 1.5 million barrels a day of production. You saw what happened to the market after the November meeting in Vienna. The market right away went up to 53 and started trading for the last uh, one, two, three, four, five months in this range between 55 to 53 dollars a barrel. And the market believed it. By golly, yes, OPEC is cutting back production. But where is the other end? Where is the demand? The demand's still not there. And what happened now in the last week is that inventories are still high. So sure, we pulled production out of the market, but we began it with high inventory, 500 million barrels a day of inventory in the U.S. just in crude oil, the highest inventory levels that we have had in a long time. So here we are again. Uh, I'm finishing up uh, below uh, $50 a barrel. Um, and to me, uh, by the way, at this level in July, our friends at Goldman Sachs were talking about $250 a barrel. Remember that? 
Goldman Sachs and the other Wall Street guys back in July, actually it was May of 2008, were talking about $250 a barrel. And reality finally catch up with them. Um, where is the price of oil going? I don't have the slightest idea. But all that I know is that demand has to come up. There has to be a demand pool. It is basic economic 101. If India and China, even though they're about 6.5, close to seven, seven points of GDP, Brazil, by the way, that was one of the big countries, is down, you know. Uh, U.S. is 2.4, 2.6 growth. The same thing with Europe. I still think that you need a demand pool and you need to bring down inventories. Uh, the next OPEC meeting is in May. Uh, we'll see what they have to do if they want to cut more production. Remember that a lot of these countries, they need the revenues. Uh, if you look at Saudi Arabia, if you look at Angola, if you look at Nigeria, if you look at Venezuela, a lot of these countries that depend over 80% of their national budget on crude exports need the barrel of oil to be around $70, $75 a barrel. Uh, so there'll be, there'll be pressure come, uh, come May for the OPEC folks. Uh, that's it. I mean, we talked about a lot of things, and we're more than happy to have a conversation about almost any subject any of you guys want to talk about. So you mentioned political continuity, but uh, what about possibly encouraging political discontinuity if you foresee problems down the road? Uh, I was just reading something about uh, the Iranian uh, you know, I mean, uh, what happened there in 1979, and uh, a lot of people are not aware that actually President Kennedy was pushing for change in Iran, and his death was kind of, uh, basically it let the Shah off the hook, and he went back to his old ways, and, uh, you know, I mean, basically that thing blew up 15 years later. So do you think sometimes it's better to, you know, be, especially with the case of the Middle Eastern, you know, Gulf, Persian Gulf countries, maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea to, you know, uh, encourage some change instead of just sticking with political continuity. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, continuity in the Middle East, uh, to me, would mean lower oil prices. Because the potential of Iraq and Iran, both Iraq and Iran, Again, it's not an issue of geology in those two countries. Those two countries is, a, is an issue with production and, and getting that oil out of the ground. I think if you add the two countries together from where they are in production today, you probably have a million, a million and a half barrels a day of capacity that over the next two or three years can come on stream. It's not an issue of geology. Venezuela. I mean, Venezuela, if, if tomorrow we have a, a, talk about a geopolitical impact in the region. If, if Mr. Maduro tomorrow is replaced by a government that is willing to change the rules of the game and is willing to again attract the national oil companies to come back into Venezuela and run the business, within a three-year period, three to five, Venezuela could be again producing over three million barrels a day, more oil in the market. And that's my argument that unless demand goes up somewhere, Long term, this market is not going to go above $60 a barrel. I just don't see it. Now, the only thing is could be, again, a major crisis in the Middle East, uh, a major political situation in Saudi Arabia. Yes, that will certainly bring the, barrel, the, the market uh, back up to $100 a barrel. But right now, assuming that there is political stability in the Middle East, I, I, just don't, I just don't see the barrel of oil over $60 a barrel. I just, I just don't see it. And remember that at $60 a barrel, shale production in the U.S. can turn around, right, in a matter of, what, six, nine months, 12 months. Shorter than that. So to me, the, 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 the sleeping giant that we have in Venezuela, the sleeping giant that we have in the U.S. and, 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 and in Iran and Iraq, would it could increase worldwide refinery production, I mean crude oil production, easily by two million barrels a day in a, in a very short period of time. I just don't see the pressure of prices uh, going up, up, you know, up, unless a, geopo a major geopolitical event in the Persian Gulf. Hi. Uh, I was wondering if you have any reflections or thoughts on 
the geopolitical significance of the financial sector and its um, expanding participation in oil and gas industries. I'm thinking in particular of, um, you know, like the strange simultaneity of, uh, you know, the increasing financial interest in um, commodity speculation around 2004, 2005, the rise of shale, and in particular after 2008, 2009. Um, there's an argument, for example, uh, that uh, the development of shale in the U.S., particularly tight oil, uh, is entirely dependent on the availability of cheap debt in the post-financial crisis environment. So I'm wondering if you just have any thoughts about uh, the geopolitics of finance in the oil markets. To me, that's an intraday phenomenon. It's a what phenomenon? Intraday yeah. phenomenon. Price volatility because of speculation, price volatility because of the spread between crude oils, uh, price volatility because of change of, of freight rates, uh, uh, price volatility because of arbitrage, uh, price volatility because of a hurricane coming into the Gulf Coast and impacting one of the refineries. That's why you that 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 that's why that's not a straight line. That's not a, that's why that's not a straight line. So to me, the financial uh, the, the impact of the dollar on crude oil, crude oil is bought and sold not. Uh, so, so again, the spread between the U.S. dollars and the euro, for example, has an impact on the price of oil. But again, that is not a long-term event. That's what brings about the volatility. And that's why I was never a trader. I was always a, a, a long-term physical player uh, because it's easier to, to manage. It is very difficult to manage that intraday or intraweekly volatility that is caused primarily uh, because of speculation in the financial market and also the spread and the impact that the dollar has. So, yes, it's important, but to me, it really doesn't have a long-term impact. I'm going to ask a question, Jorge, on your refineries idea. So if you were the <clears throat> United States government or international oil companies in the West and you wanted stability in Latin America, would you help them invest in refineries in their locations or invest in refineries in your locations and sell them refined products? Well, first of all, that the, the, you know, the U.S. doesn't have a national oil company. So in the U.S., uh, we, we... National oil companies. If you were yeah, but what I'm saying is the, the state, the government uh, cannot have that policy. Now, you bring a good point. You, If you lower environmental regulations in this country, if you make easier for U.S. refineries to be built and expanded, by the way, the U.S. refineries have increased capacity in the last 20-something years. Even though the last refinery that was built in this country was uh, Marathon Garyville Refinery, and that was 1976. And, the, and, and so we have built, I, I think, from 15 million barrels a day, we're about 17 million barrels a day of refinery capacity without building a new refinery. Because what we did is we became very, very good at de-bottlenecking de the, the existing system. Uh, but you're right. I mean, we could very well expand refinery capacity if some of the environmental regulations or, 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 or if some of the uh, enforcement of the environmental regulations go away, particularly out in the West Coast. Um, so, yes, environmental regulations from the central government can certainly impact that. Um, we haven't seen in the last uh, six months anybody knocking on Mexico's door to build a brand new refinery. <laughs> Building a refinery is not an easy, I mean, it's, uh, trust me guys, it, it's, uh, it, it, it takes five to seven years to build a new refinery. It's not only the environmental cost and the process of getting the permits, and nobody wants a refinery in their backyard. I mean. Uh, forget it. Building a refinery today is not an easy task. And like I said, there is not one single refinery being built in Latin America, even though the region is 2 million barrels a day short. So, so thanks again. Enjoy this. Um, there are so many moving parts. This is all somewhat a, a wild guess. But what's your guess on sort of the lower bound price floor and then maybe price ceiling for a barrel of oil, ignoring above ground. I mean, the floor we touched in 30 for just a little bit a and year I, or so ago. Right, right? and I'm back in but, 2008. Right, but it, but it looks like now, you know, it's holding somewhat firm around 50s, in the high 40s, 50s, right? And I guess that might be set by the marginal cost so supplier, which is shale, I think. And like here, we heard from um, Scott Sheffield from Pioneer at the KBH 
session about how they're driving down the cost. So we get a feel for you know where the floor is, but if you ignore Saudi Arabia having issues and, and such not, just say technological substitution, drop in biofuels, you'll go in jets, electric vehicles, you know, where's the ceiling where even if you didn't have a disruption in supply, if the price just over time drifted, the demand response and substitutability would kick in yeah. at some price. Where do you think that is? I, I learned uh, when I was with Shell that with the group that I was working, these projections into 2030 or 2040 were for some other economists to look at. And I learned early on in my career, my experience with Shell, was that we looked at seven year span. We were not interested in what the price of oil was going to be in 2040. And the reason that we had this seven year span is because seven years is the time from inception to commercialization of a petrochemical plant, of a deep water well, uh, of a refinery. So the, what we looked at was, okay, what's on stream? What new production is coming on stream? What new petrochemical refinery uh, or petrochemical capacity is coming? And we look at that horizon of seven years, and then we work that price calculation or future price of, of whether it was the, the raw material or the product within, within that seven year time frame. We never look again further out. Uh, if you look, look at this price range uh, between 80 and 100, uh, between 2010 and what was it, 2015. I think what we're experiencing today, it's going to be somewhere in this $52 range. And I think that's, that's where you're going to be. And right now, OPEC is the one that is going to be able to control that price around that price range. I don't think come May, come May, I don't think you're going to see OPEC saying, let's cut back another million barrels a day. They can't afford it. They, 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 they just, I mean, plain mathematics, volume times price. They cannot make up the difference with what they need for the national budget. They, it, 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 they can't do it. Run the, run the math. This is not algebra. This is pure arithmetic. They, 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 they can't do it. Um, so I, I think that everybody's going to be under pressure to try to keep it certainly at this level. I don't know if I answered your question. I certainly don't see the, the market in the next few years going over about 50 unless we have a major issue in the, in the Persian Gulf. And again, there's going to be a floor. Uh, this 49 price today, you're going to see it come back in the next few days and stay around 50. I just don't see it. Uh, I have a question. I was just cu uh, curious, you didn't even mention Russia once in your entire presentation. <laughs> so do you think they don't, they're not going to play a major role in the geopolitics of oil or with what's happening in the Middle East and also their sanctions in the Arctic Ocean? So what, what's your the, take on? The only geopolitical lever that, that Russia has is natural gas to Europe. That's it. If they want to play the geopolitical card, the only leverage or, or that, that Russia has is natural gas supply uh, to Western Europe. Uh, they're not going to combat production. Uh, by the way, the, the OPEC agreement, they agree in November, I think it was the 10th of November when they had their meeting, that effective January 1st, they were going to cut back production. Those two months, every one of those countries, including Russia, maximize production out of, I mean, they just produce tons of oil. And they began loading ships, and there they were ships in floating storage all over the place. So they built a huge inventory coming into January and February. Russia began the year around 10.4 million barrels a day. They ended up November at over 11 million barrels a day. So when they announced the cutback, guess where they announced the cutback from? It wasn't from the volume back in January, it was from the volume in November. So even the OPEC production cut, cuts were really from the high point, not from the earlier lower points. Uh, Russia is uh, an it's, it's, it's 800 pound gorilla, no question about it. In fact, Russia is one of those conversations that we can have about energy independence and, and energy security. 
Russia is energy independent. Is it not? Or am I missing something? They have enough natural gas. In the, Russia is not an importer of crude or hydrocarbons or anything. They're self-sufficient. And they have continuity, you name it. But do they have energy security? Um, and remember, energy security is the ability to monetize those natural gas resources that have to go to Europe. And the Europeans are looking for other sources, whether it's from the north or from the south, to bring in natural gas. Uh, because otherwise, Russia would have them by the, by the throat. So Russia is important, big player. What is the second, third largest producer? If you look at the US, Saudi Arabia, and Russia, those are the top three. Um, uh, I'm not worried too much about Russia, really. Um, I'm more worried, I, I, I am more concerned, not that I don't, I do sleep at night, um, but if there was a reason for me not to sleep at night, uh, to me is Saudi Arabia. Um, I think the royal family and I think the, that government, uh, it's, um, it's not too secure. I don't know what other word to use. I'm, I'm very, I'm, you know, if, if, there, if there's something out there uh, that could happen, my vote is, uh, that is going to be in the kingdom, and that that that's a total new game. If that happens, guys, that's going to be uh, uh, a major impact. Okay. There's one more question over there. So you talk about the leverage uh, that could happen between Mex uh, the U.S. and Mexico with respect to the fuel oil because now, uh, because of the Keystone pipeline. But what about, for example, natural gas? Because Mexico has shifted a lot of its electricity to natural gas. And right now, most of that is imported from the U.S. Right. And there's a lot of pipelines that are being constructed. But I think that even though if the U.S. has a lot of NGL terminals, the quantities that you can export with natural gas are huge, right, with respect to the NGL. So you think the U.S. could have a leverage, but then in the future, what it, once Mexico starts producing gas, how could that affect? Like, how do you see the yeah. geopolitics between I, the I, U.S. The, and Mexico? Yeah, the, I, I, I think that relationship, that dependency of Mexico uh, from the U.S. Uh, is going to be long term. Uh, remember that Mexico's natural gas production today is associated gas. Uh, Mexico's true natural gas production is very little. Uh, again, most of their gas production is associated natural gas with crude oil production. Um, and what's going to be, Richard is not here anymore, but most of the stuff that is being uh, now uh, going up in deep water is all oil. Uh, by the way, in June, it's going to be the concessions for Burgos, which is for Mexico's shale. Um, and I will, I'm being taped, so I've got to be careful how I say this. Thank you. Um, the issue with Mexico's development, the, the, the development of shale resources in Mexico is going to be an issue with safety and security because all of that resource is in northern Mexico. And safety and security in northern Mexico cannot be guaranteed by the government to the operators. Uh, so when the, uh, it'll be fun to see the, the concessions round 2.1, I think it is, it's going to be in June, I think it's June 16th. A bunch of companies, by the way, Conoco, Shell, everybody sign up. Uh, it'll be fun to see what happens in June and how many international oil companies go after, after Shell production in Burgos, which you know, is, is the extension of, of, of the Eagle Fort. And, and it's not because the resource is not there and it's not because we don't know what the, the technology is. Uh, what was it, Chevron, uh, Exxon just bought 250,000 acres from the Bass family and they pay what, six billion dollars for, for, for U.S. Permian Basin? You know, so, uh, so the economics are there, the long-term economics are there for Northern Mexico, uh, but it's going to be an issue who's going to work out in Northern Mexico with the lack of security around uh, drug cartels and everything else that's going on. So, no, I, I think Mexico will continue to be a net importer of natural gas from the U.S. Uh, they're doing a fantastic job with renewables, uh, wind and solar. Um, but, but again, it's going to be the dependency of Mexico from the U.S. in energy. By the way, which is one of the things that we really have to have a conversation with this administration. Uh, and I hope that with somebody like, like Rex Tillerson at State and Perry at, at DOE, uh, this administration understands uh, that the relationship with, with Mexico 
putting aside whatever our political issues are around immigration and, and, and safety and other issues, uh, energy is it, important. Talk about food employment, the reason that our refineries are, are running full blast in the Gulf Coast, you know, the average pay, the average salary in the Gulf Coast for a petrochemical and or refinery employee is about $81,000 a year. And if all of a sudden, you know, you cut Mexico off, uh, you know, the Gulf Coast is going to be expanded. I don't know where Mexico will go to buy its gasoline. Uh, but, you know, Mexico is, bottom line is, Mexico's U.S., Mexico, Texas relationship in energy, natural gas, refined products, crude oil is extremely important, long term, not short term. Thank you very much, man. Thank you, guys.